Good morning. My name is Evan Morikawa, and I think a lot about email. I work with a company called Nihilus, and we build APIs on top of email, calendar, and contacts, which makes it a lot easier for all of you to be able to access all the context and insight that's contained inside of a mailbox. But this morning, I would actually like to talk about the history of email. And the reason why I want to talk about the history of email is because embedded in that history is not just 47 years of fun random facts, but it also kind of parallels the history of communication between computers and therefore people over the past half a century. So to start us off, I'm going to take us all the way back to 1969. Uh, we had just gone to the moon. It is October. Specifically, it is October 28th at 10.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Uh, it is not cold because we're in Los Angeles. And uh, Charlie Klein had just sent from his SDS Sigma 7 the world's first message across the ARPANET to an SDS 940 in Stanford. And the contents of that message? Login. Uh, but this is the very first time that we had this distributed means of communication at first between two computers and then many more. Um, unfortunately, the ARPANET inventors claim it was not explicitly designed to prevent uh, a resilient network in the case of nuclear Armageddon. However, this is 1969. Dr. Strangelove just came out. This is not uh, an abstract concept that you might need to be able to packet switch anything in any network anywhere in the world. Uh, luckily for us, that didn't happen. And the unintended consequence was the world's largest distributed network uh, we ever saw. It didn't take very long, only uh, two years later in 1971, when Ray Tomlinson took these two PDP-10s and used a couple different old protocols that had been existing on time to share systems and sent a message to each other. And he needed to decide, well, how am I supposed to address this other computer? Well, for that, he used the at symbol on the keyboard, which at the time had some amount of semantic sense, he claimed, but also was just not a control character yet on the Timex time-sharing system uh, that was used on these old PDP-10s at the time. Uh, Ray was 30 years old when uh, this was developed, and uh, with only within a couple years, it uh, ballooned by 1973 to be 75% of all of the traffic across the ARPANET. <laughs> Uh, this is the entire ARPANET as it existed in 1973. And you can see that it had grown considerably from two computers, although not by much. You know, it, it had a ways to go. Uh, but this is only the first of many times that you will see how this communication protocol took off explosively. Um, at first, between a bunch of researchers there and a bunch of PDP-10s and IBM 360s and a couple consoles, to later becoming the world's largest installed communication base. But it has very humble beginnings. Um, Send MSG is actually the protocol that Ray Thomason used to build email on top of. This actually had existed since the mid-60s, but it was used to talk to the same people on the same time sharing system. It was designed to replace post-it notes when they would leave each other notes when someone would sign off and somebody would come back in in an inbox on the same Timex time sharing system. Uh, so that was like his context when he was thinking about, oh, I'm going to do my post-it note system, but across the room. <laughs> Um, and, that, and that's really the humble beginnings of where this entire communication protocol stemmed from. Uh, if we accelerate a little bit further, not that much further, really only over the next couple years, uh, it was a whole series of alphabet soup of in additions and extensions on top of these protocols. So RD turned into NRD, turned into WRD, turned into banner, turned into message, turned into MS, and Dave Crocker built MS out of message in 1975. Uh, to try and better codify this communication system that had been used all over the ARPANET. There was now clearly the way to talk to your friends across the country from BBN to MIT to Stanford. Um, and it was also about this time that we were trying to get this idea of standardizing the payload of a message. It wasn't totally freeform. Uh, 1977, we came out with the RFC 733, the standard for the format of ARPA network text messages. Uh, that standard has a lot of the vestiges, uh, like the two and CC fields, uh, that we see uh, to this very day. Um, and then in 1982, we have RFC 821, uh, which is better known as SMTP, or the Simple Mail Transfer Protocol, that, uh, uh, that was created by John Postol in 1982. 
um, which I think is a great last name if you're inventing a uh, mail protocol. Uh, but nonetheless, this uh, was once again the, only the next evolution in a step to codify the ability to get a message hopped across a bunch of different networks to anywhere at this point in the like ever increasing and fledgling internet. Um, that protocol is still very much used today uh, from everything uh, that, uh, that we use underneath our hood to the way that most mail still gets around the planet as it exists, and here it is in 1982. Um, it was also about this time in 1983 that Eric Ullman wrote a program called SendMail, uh, which he installed on the brand new Berkeley operating system in 1983, and it relied on this brand new concept called TCP IP. Uh, so not only could you address things with SMTP and this at sign convention, but you could now start to route it in a much broader concept across the internet. Uh, SendMail uh, has exploded. It had its real heyday in the 90s. In 1996, SendMail was 80% of all publicly reachable servers on the internet. Um, so it was a pretty monumental thing that Eric Ullman did back in the mid-80s there. Um, if you take a look at what SMTP actually looks like under the hood, uh, you'll see the commands there are in, are in blue and the responses in, um, in black and it's actually a fairly straightforward protocol. It was designed to be compact, right? It was designed to work on systems that had just barely gotten out of the age of core memory. Um, and it was designed to be a very simple protocol to be able to send data back and forth. But you see, it's actually not, it's somewhat structured, but not particularly structured. And we'll see a continuing trend of adding more and more and more layers on top of uh, what was this initially fairly simple protocol. Um, <clears throat> send mail comes out, the 80s have an explosion of protocols, not just being able to send mail, but also being able to read it as well. In 1984, POP, the post office protocol, was released, followed by POP2 and POP3 in 85 and 88, respectively. Um, so sort of a quick flurry of events there. Um, and then we have this other one that prob people probably have never heard of called X400, which was launched in 1984. That one's significant uh, because it was kind of a direct competitor to SMTP. It's sort of this first time, uh, not, not the last, as you'll see shortly, where we started to have this uh, competition of ways to get data across the world. Um, and this competition sort of started in the mid-80s and continued to grow, uh, and actually until this day. You'll see X400 come back later when we talk about Microsoft, which is a fun piece. So it's about this time in 1986 that IMAP, or the Internet Message Access Protocol, was also developed sort of out of, once again, more competing protocols try to improve on what POP was able to do only a couple of years prior. Once again, this is another protocol from 1986 that we still very heavily use today. That is actually the basis of a lot of mail client programs that uh, you would see around. Um, and this was Mark Crispin in 1986 trying to just make it easier to consume a lot of the mail that we have and start to introduce and codify this concept of organize it into folders. There might be hundreds and hundreds of messages across kilobytes that you might need to access at any given time. Um, so the world was changing. Uh, IMAP, sort of what you can see here, was a little bit more complicated, um, but still, uh, so the point of showing this is that it is its own arbitrary protocol um, at a very low level. Like these get directly translated into bytes, they get sent on the wire that's independent of how uh, it moves uh, because it was designed for just this very specific use case that we have. Uh, we have IBM. So IBM, of course, this is the 80s now. They're not quite the titans they were when putting on IBM 7090s and like Gemini programs. Um, but they're still around. And uh, this is Lotus Notes in 1989. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is Lotus Notes running on an old IBM system. Um, it's sort of this very first time that we start to have this idea of a graphical user interface. The microcomputer explosion is happening. We really want these on everybody's desks. They need a way to be able to interface with them. Uh, and even back uh, in the early days of Lotus Notes, you still see a lot of vestiges of features of email that kind of are familiar today. Um, and that only continues as uh, more people get into the game. IBM was also significant in that they, they had this uh, markup language called the Generalized Markup Language. They pioneered all the way back in 1969. That got standardized into a general markup language and then subsequently got extended into a markup language um, in the 80s and 90s and sort of formed this basis of XML uh, that really turned into a large lingua franca that once again is still around today but particularly had its heyday uh, in the 90s and early 2000s as we 
tried to find better containers to package all of this data that had been flying around the internet for decades and decades and decades. Um, remember CDs like this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 1991, AOL was launched, uh, and I got a quote that they were saying their CMO claimed that at, at their peak, they were spending $300 million in 1990s dollars on just these CDs. They claimed that 50% of the world's CDs had an AOL logo on them at some point in time. Um, but nonetheless, this blitz worked, uh, and it really did get mailboxes into the homes of everybody. Uh, once again, it is uh, a continuing theme across email over the decades that it goes from one university to all universities, from one home to all the homes very rapidly. Um, so it really does become this enormously installed communication base that is pervasive everywhere, uh, largely in part thanks to sometimes uh, some amount of CDs that just get sent um, and its entrance into pop culture <laughs> and everything else that we see uh, today from it. Uh, it's also the 90s that we start to feel a little bit more consolidation of protocols. This is MIME, the multi-purpose internet mail extension in 1993. Um, and MIME was designed to do a couple things. One, encapsulate the different parts of data that we have. Also make this realization that people might want to have a many different types of media, a multi of media, if you will. Um, and it, the need to exactly specify what and how and why all the data is encoded in. Mine was a pretty uh, direct uh, like, uh, acknowledgement of the fact that there were so many different content types and so many different modes and media of exchanging information at this point that you needed yet another entirely separate layer just to specify all the different types of data that you have uh, in there too. Um, so this is a, an increasingly more complex wrapping over just the basic uh, like set of uh, protocols that you might have otherwise. Um, it's tough, to talk, it's tough to talk about the 90s without talking about Microsoft. Um, Microsoft has left a pretty significant mark on the email world. Uh, this is 1991 Microsoft Mail. Uh, this is the precursor to Outlook and a lot of the mail clients are useful today. Uh, but you'll see here this Windows 3.1 screenshot also looks pretty familiar. The, the UI has about the same set of features, but uh, several more, of course. Um, Here's that X400 again. The reason we brought back X400 is because Microsoft, instead of piling on to SMTP, being the gods that they were in the 90s, decided that they were going to make their own protocols based off of X400. Uh, the early versions of Outlook talked to their servers with an arbitrary thing called the Message Application Programming Interface in 1991. They really piled on to XML and in the end, like ended up with a couple protocols, Exchange ActiveSync and Exchange Web Services, all based on XML, uh, that was exclusively designed to bypass all of the other like IMAP and POP systems and basically set up their own ecosystem to be able to talk with Outlook clients, to be able to talk with early mobile phones and PDAs and Blackberries, um, and sort of created their entire whole other ecosystem of mail protocols in the process. Um, and it's also sort of started to uh, really double down on this idea that you can continue to add more and more features to mail. This is Outlook 97. Uh, the toolbars, spoiler alert, get more features on them uh, over time and then get shoved into a ribbon and then moved elsewhere. Uh, but this is starting to nonetheless like mark the point in which we have this idea of mail as more than just messages we send to each other. It's an entire office. Um, they literally have like these like 90s icons of things you would find on your desk in an office in their uh, sidebar here, which also introduced the upcoming coupling of contacts and calendars into the mail suite as well. Uh, this is also about the time that we optimized everything to work with old Blackberries. Um, one of the reasons why they picked the XML formats was so they could pack them onto like a couple kilobytes to squeeze down to these glorified pagers that turned into Blackberries. Um, throughout the early 2000s. Um, and then we have Gmail. Uh, Gmail, that was, the, that was early Gmail in 2004. Um, we actually take that kind of for granted now. This also looks pretty familiar. They have changed their interface surprisingly little over the decades, actually. Um, but once again, this, they introduced this concept of threading and labels, which was kind of new to the mail world. Messages just used to be bundles of messages in the wind, certainly not uh, organized threads that you see here uh, that we're very used to now today. 
Uh, I also want to take a moment to talk about uh, calendars. Uh, calendars are, have been around for a while, uh, but actually it's fairly recently that they have been really bundled into the whole mail suite as well. iCalendar, that format, came out in 1998. The CalDev uh, exchange protocol to communicate between them came out in 2003. Um, uh, also bundled into there are this concept of your address book, the, old, the Rolodex of old shoved into a handful of other vCard and CardDAV protocols. CardDAV is 2011, pushed by Apple. Uh, and now we have this whole suite of systems all bundled together with uh, mail, mail solutions. Um, fun fact about calendar uh, contacts on Exchange, uh, Microsoft uh, really heavily couples their Active Directory system in your address book. So it's not like a Google Contacts totally separate thing. Um, the very same system that you use to log on to all of your thin clients in your big office building is the same Active Directory system that powers their address books, which is actually why you cannot run Exchange on a non-Windows server machine because you need the whole like enterprise admin like settings and it's directly binded into the operating system. Uh, it's a very like heavily coupled system in the case of Microsoft. Uh, right, and here we have are left with a whole alphabet soup of an enormous number of protocols uh, that have been developed over the past 47 years of email. Uh, so this is the kind of this is the current state of where we are today. Um, and this is actually the state of a lot of different systems, a lot of different APIs that exist in this conference hall. Uh, sort of also have ended up in a similar state too. Um, we definitely feel like there is a there is a trend moving to be able to consolidate a lot of this data. Um, and really just treat it as data. Um, to not worry about anymore all of the complexities of these systems that were designed for very different use cases 47 years ago, um, and instead pull them all together into a single, more easy to use protocol that's a little bit easier to reconcile with and view as just data. Um, and when we have everything as just data, it means that we can now, very easily from a command line, just send email anywhere in the world through any protocol in any provider um, anywhere and also be able to receive all of the threads that I have in an email box as just data. Um, I don't need to set up the whole IMAP connection and start having that all go through. Just think of it as data. Um, and that's one of the ways that we like to think about uh, email today is just more JSON blobs. Uh, there are a lot of JSON blobs floating around this exhibit hall uh, right now. And there's a good reason for that. It, because it means we can take all the complexity of all of these mailboxes and turn it into something that is, uh, in my opinion, actually more powerful than a particular email message. Um, it means that when you have it as just data, emails can not necessarily anymore represent an exact message you're trying to send from point A to point B. It can be just another way to help salespeople keep track of who they're talking to. It can be just another way to help lawyers keep track of the deals they're doing. It can be just another component to help schedule uh, calls with your financial advisor or help you just keep track of prospective candidates in a hiring pipeline. Um, and when you start thinking about email and calendar and contacts as an arbitrary data format, it means that you can finally get access to it as not just the protocols that you send between point A to point B, but actually what you want to see and use them as, uh, which is just being able to really communicate with each other with this type of context and, and insight as that it's embedded in any application um, that you would want to develop on top of it. Um, this is a, definitely a similar dream that a lot of people uh, in this room share about the ability to to take all the data sources of the world and like put it together. Um, and we think that when you can access the world's largest installed communication base and sort of seamlessly put it into the fabric of applications, uh, the world can communicate uh, a little bit better going on into the future. Thank you very much.